Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final session of the Autism Basics webinar series. Today is educational programming, and I'm Erica Hurdle, Program Manager for the Iowa Regional Autism Assistance Program, here with Dr. Kelly Puzzle. Dr. Puzzle is a licensed psychologist and a clinical assistant professor working in the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospitals child and adolescent psychiatry division. She received her BA from the University of Northern Iowa and her PhD from the University of Utah. Dr. Pelzel provides assessment and treatment services for children and adolescents. She also is involved with intervention research. Additionally, Dr. Pelzel is a psychology technical consultant for the Iowa Regional Autism Assistance Program and clinical coordinator for the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital Autism Center. Dr. Pelzel is interested in evidence-based therapies for young children with and without autism. Now I will turn it over to her. Thanks, Erica. And as Erica said, we're gonna be talking about um, educational programming today. So first I'll be introducing some terms and some processes. Some of the processes are specific to Iowa. Um, we'll be talking about parts of an IEP. Um, specifically about goals, we'll be talking about interventions and accommodations, um, and then some resources, again, that are going to be pretty Iowa specific. If you're joining us from somewhere outside of Iowa, I'll also have a slide at the end um, with some ideas of um, where you would want to go to find out information uh, that's individualized to where you're living. Uh, so this is the last week for this webinar series. I appreciate everyone joining um, or watching the videos later on. And um, I'll certainly be able to take some questions again at the end today. Um, but if we don't get to your question, um, for sure, uh, feel free to send questions on this webinar or the prior ones in. Um, we also would love to get any feedback that you have about the webinar series, things that you liked about it, things that you think we should do a little bit differently, or if you feel like we're missing topics, um, things that you would like to see in the future, because um, we, we try to hold this a couple times a year and we do change it up uh, from session to session. So just let us know uh, kind of what you're thinking and what you liked about it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say before I started on these slides um, was that um, is that I'm not a school psychologist. I don't have school psychology training. Um, that's kind of a separate training program than uh, what a child clinical psychologist does. And so uh, my knowledge of IEP uh, processes and uh, things in the classroom is not um, nearly as rich as if I were trained as a school psychologist. And coupled with that, I've never worked for any school districts or area education agencies here in Iowa. Um, so I haven't learned that way either. Um, and uh, I've been particularly humbled by this uh, by this, this year um, because I've had a postdoctoral fellow with me um, who did train as a school psychologist and now is changing to uh, a private practice psychologist mid-career. And, and so oftentimes I think I kind of know about something and then she, has been teaching me, you know, it actually works a little bit more this way. Um, and so uh, my advice to you as you're listening to me is um, take that, uh, I don't think I'm saying anything incorrect in this webinar, but you know, take it all with the, with the, with the perspective of a clinical psychologist. And you certainly should be um, talking to your IEP team or folks at the AEA and school districts uh, to determine um, what is correct procedure for them. Okay, so uh, we're going to kind of go through um, uh, a few different terms here and a few different uh, processes that go with these different aspects of special education. So the overall federal uh, federal law that, uh, that covers special education is called IDEA. Uh, the part of it that uh, covers services for young kids um, here in Iowa is called early access. Um, other places you may have it here it referred to as zero to three or part C. That just means it's the part of the law that's like the part C in the law um, of the, the big long law. And 
uh, we'll be talking about early childhood special education. So things that would be preschool age programming. We'll be talking about special education, so K through 12 programming. And we'll also be talking about 504s, which are not part of IDEA, but their own set of legislation. So let's start by talking about the law overall. So the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act guarantees students with disabilities the right to a free and appropriate public education. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to this as FAPE, okay, free and appropriate uh, public education. And uh, it's provided within the least restrictive environment, or well, sometimes you'll see this abbreviated as LRE. Um, so parents can request an assessment to determine if their child uh, uh, would meet for being able to get specially designed instruction uh, if they need it. Um, and that kind of assessment is typically called an educational evaluation. Um, and that's going to determine if an educational disability exists. It's not going to make a medical diagnosis. So it's a separate process than like going to see a psychologist, you know, in private practice or at a hospital or something where they will tell you, you know, according to the manual, uh, you know, your child meets criteria for autism spectrum disorder or intellectual disability. Um, it's, it's not a medical diagnosis like that. It's determining whether that educational disability exists. Um, the evaluation team includes a specialist um, and that has experience with autism. Um, whenever kids are evaluated, there has to be a specialist that knows a little bit about autism. And um, importantly, even if kids already have a medical diagnosis, so someone's um, for instance, come to see me and I've diagnosed autism spectrum disorder, an educational evaluation still must be completed to determine if the child is eligible for special education programming. That's a separate process. Now, they will take um, information um, from medical providers, and certainly I think they're not going to repeat um, testing unless there's some question about the validity of it. Um, but if a for instance, a school, uh, sorry, a clinical psychologist such as myself has done something like IQ testing. Um, they, they can take those numbers and, and use them as part of their decision making process. Okay, so the youngest kids being served through IDEA um, are kids that are ages zero, one, and two. It's called zero to three, but actually it stops at two years, 11 months. Um, as I said before, this is called early access in Iowa, and basically it's, you know, early intervention um, along with uh, assessment and also service coordination. And so Part C is just that part in the, the federal special education law um, saying that we, that this needs to be delivered in every state. Um, it's delivered free of cost to the family in a child's home. Um, sometimes, particularly like if Parents are working during daytime hours. Um, sometimes it's delivered in the daycare as well. And what's developed for very young kids is called the IFSP, um, Individualized Family Service Plan. And this document describes what the child's um, strengths and weaknesses are and then what the intervention goals are going to be as well as specifics about the kinds of services and supports they're going to be getting um, while they're receiving uh, Part C services. Um, so for instance, um, if they have a significant communication delay, um, the services are probably going to be um, some uh, speech or speech language therapy with a speech pathologist. And that's all spelled out in the IFFP document. In Iowa, the area education, Area education agencies um, typically provide most of the direct uh, Part C services. And Iowa is divided up in different AEA regions here. You can see on the, the map here. Um, there are some other people involved as well, including Department of Education, Public Health, Human Services, and Child Especially Clinics are also involved with, uh, with the uh, Part C services. So um, there is actually an overall 1-800 number you can call um, listed there uh, where a provider um, can make a referral, a family can self-refer, 
um, in order for a child to have an evaluation through the AEA um, to determine if they would uh, benefit from Part C services. And if they do qualify, then that IFSP is written and services are started. And the criteria generally are that um, kids have to have a health or a physical condition that may affect their growth or development um, and or have had significant developmental delays in their ability to play, think, talk, or move. Um, and again, you don't need a medical diagnosis to receive, receive services through early access. Once kids are getting close to turning three, um, that early access team uh, can help with the transition to early childhood special education programming if the child, um, if they think the child's gonna be eligible um, for that. Um, so a lot of times as they're finishing up their Part C services, they're doing some kind of um, post evaluation to see kind of where the child's at in their skills and then passing that information and meeting with that early childhood uh, group to be able to assist them in writing the IEP. Some kids, however, um, you know, don't qualify for early childhood special education programming after they've had early access. So they had some, for instance, some sort of speech delay. They have these early access services through their ISSP, their um, speech um, improved, and then they don't qualify anymore. That's a possibility as well. So with early childhood special education, um, these are going to be your intervention services for preschool age children, and they are part of the AEAs in the local school districts. Um, one exception is Des Moines Public Schools operates without AEA uh, assistance. And um, they provide those services through what's called an IEP or an individualized education program. So this is a written plan that's going to focus on the, the learning needs of the individual child. And it has to uh, include education goals, documentation of how the, how the child's currently doing, and what kind of supports and services are being provided, and what kind of modifications the school is providing to help ch the child meet their goals, as well as a way to measure um, progress toward those, toward those IEP goals. So just like with um, the very young kids um, in early access, a provider or school staff um, can re um, refer a child for an evaluation or a family can self-refer at this age as well. And um, then, like I said, some kids transition from early access into this program. And if found eligible for early childhood special education, um, then that IEP is written and the services are started. Um, this is really important um, to Iowa. Um, we're, we do things a little bit differently than a lot of states. Um, so a lot of states um, on your IEP, um, you, the, the child has a designation of what category of disability they're being served under. So for instance, in many states, if a child has autism, then they're gonna be served under the category of educational autism. Um, Iowa does not, use that, they're, they're what's considered a non-categorical state. Um, again, you don't need a medical diagnosis, but you also aren't um, served under a specific category of disability, um, but rather they look at um, where the individual's um, deficits are and work on writing an individualized uh, IEP for them. And as kindergarten approaches, then the IEP team, again, is going to help to assist with that transition to kindergarten programming, which is going to be done through special education instead of early childhood special education. Um, so these are those services for children and young adults, actually, um, provided by AEAs and local school districts up to age 21. And again, Des Moines Public operates without the AEA assistance. And it is still, the document is still called an IEP and it includes those same things that I listed before. Um, so the way the documentation and things are set up between preschool years and uh, K through 12 years um, looks real similar. Uh, obviously the, the goals and what's available in terms of services and support changes um, as 
as kids get older. Um, but the way the document reads is very, very similar. So same kind of thing um, that a, a provider or school staff um, can refer a, child, refer a child for evaluation or a family can self-refer. Um, I forgot to mention this before, but if you know someone else besides the family refers, um, the, the parents or other caregivers must provide permission in order for that evaluation to happen. So it's something where a parent is signing, um, giving their permission for their child to be evaluated. And then some kids come into special education from having an early childhood special education programming and their IEP follows with them from those preschool years. And, you know, just like before, if they're found eligible, an IEP is written and services are started. And also the same non-categorical piece holds true for K through 12 students. One thing um, to keep in mind is um, when kids get into those high school years, um, by law, um, post-secondary transition planning um, starts to happen. Now, federal law man mandates that it starts by age 16, but in Iowa, we actually start it at age 14. So this is a plan for transitioning you know, from high school to whatever's coming after high school for that child in terms of learning, living and working in the community. And that's gonna look different um, for, for every child based on um, their needs and abilities. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show a little video here of an IEP meeting. Um, just so in case you haven't been to one to get a little feel for what it's like, um, because I think it can be a, a bit of an intimidating and sometimes anxiety provoking uh, experience for families. Um, there are oftentimes a lot of people from the AEA and the school uh, program there and um, just not quite sure what to expect. So I think this video um, is a pretty realistic uh, depiction of what an IEP meeting might sound like. Now, I think this, just based on what they're talking about is probably an IEP meeting for a child with dyslexia. Um, so I apologize, I couldn't find a great example for one for a child with autism, um, but the way that um, things are brought up and talked about, I think would be parallel to what you might experience in an IEP meeting. According to federal law, an individualized education plan or IEP must be created for each student who qualifies for special education services. Jennifer and Bernard are the parents of one such student, nine-year-old Sean. As part of the IEP team, parents meet with teachers, specialists, and administrators to review Sean's educational plan. IEP teams meet at least once a year. Sean's teacher begins by reviewing his strengths. In terms of where his sight word vocabulary is, it's Measure, we measured it recently at the fourth grade level. However, his word attack skills are, I would say, around the mid-second to, to uh, early third. So there is a year discrepancy. Mm -hmm. But comprehension is different yeah, when so. text is read to him. We know that his strong cognitive skills ha um, have allowed him to progress at a normal rate in that area in understanding text. Is he reading more at home? Do you see him trying to read more or is it not? I started a book with him the other night. He did not want it at all. And I said, well, I'll just read the first chapter to you. And then he got so interested in it. It was a new book by James Marshall that he said, oh, read me another chapter. And I did. And But then he said, oh, I want to read another chapter myself. So I thought, well, at least he can get started on something and get his interest in it a little bit. Well, he still it. struggles, of course, because even though his sight vocabulary mm -hmm. is at a certain level, and I think his comprehension is even beyond that, mm -hmm. but if he doesn't know a word, he still doesn't have the strategies uh, firmly mm -hmm. enough so that he can, can read on his own. So I'm sure it's frustrating for him because he wants to really know what happens, but it's hard to take the time to break all these words down. Um, so mm -hmm. my guess is that he'd much prefer someone else to read it to him. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm, definitely. I'm finding that he's he's in Boy Scouts. And I have to read the handbook to him, and he prefers me to read it to him. 
Sean's teacher moves on to discuss an area that needs improvement. What we really needed to address at the beginning of the year was Sean's weak phonology. When he was presented with nonsense words like sizz and baz, Sean had a significant difficulty isolating each sound, blending them to formulate the nonsense word. So we had to go back to the drawing board in the area of phonology and review with him the consonant sounds and also build his vowel discrimination. And that's what we've been doing this year. And we've seen some nice improvement. Specialists next report on Sean's latest assessments. On here are individual number and letters, num numbers and letters. Some of them are reversed and Sean had to find which ones were reversed and identify them. And that for him is not a problem. He missed more reversals whenever they were couched within a word. There really is an obvious visual difficulty here in terms of discrimination Sorry. and probably within the text when there's a lot of words on a page, it's going to be a lot harder for him. Sean's speech therapist offers her progress report. Um, what happens is when Sean says those sibilant sounds like CH, SH, J, and S, um, air escapes through the sides of his tongue and it's not supposed to. And I think this is all, as Lisa was saying, he, he has low tone, his body, and that goes along um, with the muscles in his face and his tongue. So he, we're strengthening, strengthening his tongue and his cheeks and his oral, all his oral motor muscles, um, which will lead to cl more clear speech. This discussion will lead to a revised IEP, which will set new goals for Sean. Sorry about that. We'd like is to see him write more, produce more complex sentences using compound words. What we want to see him do is start building compound sentences and not just stick to simple sentences because, because he speaks in compound right. sentences. That's true. His writing looks great. I mean, he's doing a good job, but it's, it is tiring for him. Mm -hmm. And my goals for next year, we, we have been working on typing. We're working on him being able to form small words without looking at the keyboard. I give him a lot of credit because it, it took a lot of patience on his part to be able to negotiate his really, really strong comprehension skills and yet his very weak phonology and be willing to trust in us that we were providing him with the right strategies that would, in the end, and, and I have confidence in this, uh, make him a strong reader. The revised IEP being reviewed today will lay out accommodations, specific services and supports tailored to Sean's needs. The IEP will also describe Sean's current performance, measurable goals, and how much of Sean's education will take place with children with disabilities. Parents must consent to the plan before it's implemented. Then all of the IEP team members can work together to help Sean reach the highest possible goals in the months ahead. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a feel for what that meeting might look like. Now we're gonna talk about some of the goals and interventions that go into an IEP. Uh, so what makes a good IEP goal? Uh, it's one that takes into account the current skills and then um, suggests, uh, suggests a challenge um, that would be reasonable to complete within a 12 month period. Um, so we want to uh, aim just right um, in terms of, yes, this is something the child's gonna need to work toward, um, but it's not, uh, it is something that's achievable um, within a reasonable amount of time. Um, we make meaningful goals, meaningful to um, the education, to the family, that they need to be measured. We wanna be able to monitor them. And we wanna make goals that are useful to like think about like other decisions about the child's um, educational programming. So thinking kind of down the line as well. When the goal's written, um, it's written kind of with a specific formula where it talks about the conditions of uh, when the, the behavior or skill uh, will be performed, what exactly the skill or behavior is, and uh, the criterion for what would be an acceptable, acceptable level of performance of that skill or behavior. 
And then it's going to list um, the people that are going to be responsible for providing the services um, that will allow the child to achieve that goal. Um, so things like a uh, speech pathologist, special education teacher, general education teacher can be listed here and other uh, folks at the, the school or through the AEA here in Iowa. And um, of course, many children with IEPs have academic achievement goals. So similar to what you were hearing with the example video that I showed where um, clearly this child had a reading goal as part of their IEP, you know, math goals, writing goals, that sort of things. And then lots of kids have communication goals. So like speech or language goals or both um, where they're working with a speech pathologist. Um, but there are many other goal areas um, that, um, the IEP team um, can and should consider when writing an IEP. Uh, when we think about the IDEA law, um, it specifically says the purpose of, purpose of special education is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them free appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for future education, employment, and independent living. So, um, you know, thinking about especially that last part of that uh, sentence there, you know, so you may be thinking about goal areas beyond academics and communication. So things like behavior goals, social goals, adaptive functioning like self-care skills, um, motor skills. Uh, those are all um, areas that can be targeted um, as well in an IEP. And uh, if your child has an IEP now and um, you know, you've maybe been thinking like, well, it was kind of a process to get it up and going. Um, I don't know if I want to do all that again to add a new goal. Um, actually, adding a new goal area does not require those same processes um, that was initially used to determine eligibility. Um, they do have to collect a little baseline data to see where is that skill or that behavior at now um, so that they can set an appropriate goal. Um, but otherwise, um, it's not nearly the process that is the initial determination for an IEP. Okay, the IEP is also going to document what interventions are being used with the individual so that they can meet those IEP goals. Now, a lot of times you will see in the IEP that they are going to list generic names rather than use like some of the name brands. So, for example, um, a couple of sessions ago, we talked about Teach um, as an uh, education program. There was a comprehensive intervention um, that has emerging evidence, right? And um, TEACH is kind of the brand name. Um, what you'll oftentimes see in uh, an IEP would be the term structured teaching. So that's a lot of those, um, uh, those approaches from TEACH, uh, but with a more generic name for it. Or for example, um, there's a, a type of intervention called social stories, but that is kind of a trademark. Um, name brand um, thing. And so oftentimes you'll see uh, social narratives um, listed out in the IEP document um, saying we're going to do something along the lines of social stories, um, but we're maybe not going to use that brand name program. Okay. Uh, the IEP is also going to deliver who document who's delivering the intervention and the, as well as um, the duration the frequency, the intensities, right? So how many times a week or month, how long those sessions are, those kinds of things. Um, interventions also can include things like um, assistive technology or um, instructional technology tools, adaptations to physical settings, in addition to what we'd consider more like intervention or teaching techniques. And members of the IEP team should advocate for interventions with an established evidence base. Probably not surprising to hear me say that. Um, and it is definitely okay for members of the IEP team, IEP team including uh, parents, to be asking questions about the evidence base for any proposed intervention. It may require, right, a little bit of um, research. Um, this is a, Kind of overwhelming chart here, so I apologize for that. But um, I just pulled it because you know a couple of webinars ago we had talked about the list of evidence-based approaches, and um, you know this is a chart that 
the North Carolina folks um, produced that kind of shows like, hey, in terms of like goal areas, what do we know works for what ages? So this is the kind of thing that would be great for an IEP team to be consulting as they propose um, a certain intervention for a certain goal area for a child of a certain age, okay? And now I want to talk a little bit about accommodations and, mo and modifications a little bit as well. Um, I think we'll start out with a video here and then um, and talk a little bit more about the specifics here after the video. For students with disabilities, the right accommodations and modifications can be as important to school success as appropriate IEP goals. These educational supports are similar, but they are not the same. Accommodations change how a student accesses information, participates in school activities, or demonstrates their learning. They do not change the curriculum. Modifications, however, change what is being taught or what a student is expected to learn and demonstrate. I only need you to do the circled problems for me. Accommodations can be made by adjusting the amount of work a student must complete, allowing extra time. Just go ahead and turn your paper in. Okay, you can go ahead and keep working. You've got about five more minutes. Adapting assignments. Alex, I have your shapes here. Providing extra assistance or changing the physical setting. Let's do one more page today. There is no one set list. Because each child is unique, the IEP team must identify specific strategies to help your child succeed. For example, presenting a few math problems at a time may help a student who is easily overwhelmed. Another student might benefit from short breaks or being allowed to finish an assignment at home. A student who has difficulty writing may be allowed the use of a computer, while students with a print disability may benefit from having tests read aloud. They went downtown. A child can be given an appropriate role when working in small groups. Where am I? or be allowed to participate in an activity in a different way. Beware of what? Excuse me. Being seated near the teacher helps some students stay focused. So we'll go ahead and discuss these in a minute. And assistive technology can support a wide range of needs. And if you need me, you can raise your hand and I'll come and help you, all right? In addition to accommodations, it is sometimes necessary to modify the curriculum. For example, when the class is learning how to tell time, one child might be expected to identify only the hours. While the class is working on vocabulary and spelling, another child may work from a shorter list or focus exclusively on the meaning of key words. Insects with eight legs. Parents play a vital role in crafting the IEP. After all, no one knows your child better. So at home, watch for what works and any struggles that continue. Talk to your child about what feels right to him or to her. Make sure the IEP team considers your child's needs throughout the entire school day, including classroom time. Non-academic and extracurricular activities and transportation. You are not expected to have all the answers. Other members of the IEP team will have much to contribute. You can help by making sure that all accommodations and modifications are clearly written into the IEP. Be sure to ask whether any of the modifications will impact your child's graduation. Ask questions, offer ideas, and bring up any concerns you may have. 
Open dialogue and clear documentation are essential to developing a high quality IEP. When he gets to middle school. I didn't know it was this far from the lockers to the buses. During the IEP meeting, we can talk about adding extra time to Sam's schedule. Oh, okay, great. Okay. So we've talked about quite a few modifications today. Hemos hablado acerca de muchas modificaciones. Hay un límite? She wants to know if there is a limit. No, however, we do want to be careful if we create too many modifications, she may not be able to meet the high school graduation requirements. No hay un límite. Well, I know Tori likes being around other people, but she also has a hard time with conversation. So I was wondering, did you have, you know, any other ideas that might help her with that? Well, we could try a peer buddy or we could work in small groups more often. These are great goals, but Brooke's in the sixth grade and is only reading at a second grade level. This is true, but audiobooks should help her access to content better. And I think we might be able to find some textbooks that are at a lower reading level. Tori always turns in her homework, but it's not always what was assigned. Hmm. Maybe if you can help her get started in class, she'll know she's on the right track. Sure, I could do that. I'm unclear who will follow up with each of these items. I'll handle supports during basic instruction. And I'll arrange for the seatbelt and keyboard. Accommodations and modifications should change as your child's needs change. All right, time for comprehension. If comprehension, then iPad. Are you ready? You are not limited to a standard list. Uh, can we play? So be creative and stay involved. Could go to the park? I would love to go to the park, but you're going to study first, right? Yeah. Your child is counting on you. Thanks for helping each other out. That'll be great. So you may have heard um, them mention in uh, the video that uh, sometimes if things are modified too much, then a child's not going to meet uh, graduation criteria. And um, that's changed a little bit here recently in Iowa, um, beginning in 2018. So um, starting with the class of 2022. Um, so uh, with the Every um, Student Succeeds Act, um, they had to make made changes so that they were consistent with that. So um, before that, um, sometimes regular high school diplomas uh, were awarded based solely on IE IEP goal attainment. Um, and now um, regular high school diplomas must fully align to the state required standards. So if things are modified so that they don't meet those standards anymore, um, then the child is not going to be awarded a regular high school diploma. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about this, um, there's a publication document um, available on the Department of Education website, as well as uh, a nice YouTube that uh, an organization put together to explain it um, in some detail. And I should just mention at this point that all of the links that I've had um, in the slides, particularly those that we haven't um, been watching the videos of, um, Erica is going to be sharing with you uh, by email. So you'll have all these. Um, well, I, uh, I guess I stuck this in here. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't thinking this was the next slide, but. We'll, we'll stop and talk about this. Um, I just wanted to mention a nice um, YouTube video that a couple of colleagues of mine put together. Well, it's like it was a couple of years ago now. Um, and they put it together with, um, uh, you know, in the in the heart of the pandemic um, when a lot of uh, children were um, learning um, from home and uh, doing online schooling and such. And uh, so parents were um, trying to set up some strategies and. Uh, Set, you know, set up their home um, for success in terms of uh, the online learning. Uh, but I think a lot of the strategies that are covered in this video um, work really, really well for thinking about just um, working on homework or other educational activities at home, or even like non-educational activities. Some of the things that they have in terms of visual supports, I think are, are very helpful for families. Um, so I've, I kept this slide in here. It does have a lot of things that I think would fall under um, the category of accommodation. 
um, so ways that things are presented um, and uh, how you set up the space and that sort of thing um, to assist with learning. And, and those are things that are generally considered accommodations. Now, um, some, uh, some individuals that have a clinical diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, um, when they do the educational evaluation, they do not meet eligibility for an IEP. Um, but these individuals may be able to receive school-based accommodations um, in public schools through what's called a 504 plan. And a 504 plan comes from Americans with Disabilities Act legislation. So it's a different set of laws than special education laws. Um, and these eligibility determinations are actually made by the school district. The AEA is typically not involved um, with this process. And so um, in a 504 plan, you just have listed the accommodations. Um, you do not have any sort of goals or interventions or um, those sorts of things, um, modifications as part of a 504 plan. It's just um, school-based accommodations that would be listed in there. Uh, every school district is gonna have a 504 coordinator for the district. Um, and then there's gonna be someone at the building level too, who's in charge of, of 504 plans. And typically eligible individuals have a disability that creates a substantial limitation in a major life activity. That's, um, that's how it's worded federally. And uh, for a long, after ADA was first established, there was of course a lot of um, going back and forth about what constitutes a substantial limitation, what constitutes a major life activity. Um, so there were a lot of court cases and stuff about that. And um, so then by the time um, Bush, uh, Bush Jr. was president, um, basically enough had been established um, through case law and courts so that they went and did an amendments act. Um, and generally the court sided with a broader definition of what constitutes a substantial limitation and what constitutes a major life activity. For example, when they did the amendments, um, they specifically said, you know, concentration, that's a major life activity. And I mentioned that one because um, so, many, uh, so many individuals with autism spectrum disorder also have ADHD. Um, so, you know, that is considered a major life activity and um, kids can oftentimes qualify for a 504 plan um, to have some accommodations. Uh, 504 plan, you know, it can be reviewed more often than once a year, but it, um, it has to be re re reviewed once a year uh, at a minimum. And this is just a list of real common accommodations that oftentimes students with autism have either as part of their IEP or as part of a uh, part of a 504 plan if they aren't eligible for an IEP. So things you can see where it really emphasizes consistency, um, making things visual, keeping your language simple, um, being able to repeat things, um, having a, a work environment that's gonna encourage concentration, um, having extra time or um, having some assistance, right? Um, making sure that the child's comprehending and providing a lot of feedback and reinforcement. Um, so these are things that are pretty common to see in 504 plans or in the accommodation section of a IEP. Now I'm gonna start talking about some resources. And again, these are gonna be pretty Iowa specific. Um, first of all, our Department of Education has a very nice um, page on autism spectrum disorder. So I would encourage you to, to take a look at that. Um, and um, there's a, a, a lot of information about um, definitions and services and who to connect with at the AEAs um, that you can all get off of this page. Um, one of the things that's mentioned on this page is AEA resource teams. Um, they're not quite all called the same thing from AEA to AEA, but within each AEA, there is a set of staff 
who have some specialized training and interest in autism spectrum disorder. And these folks aren't typically part, a part of just any one IEP team, but rather they serve more as like consultants for, um, for a region of the, the AEA region, like a sub-region, I should say. So they go from school district to school district and um, be able to provide consultation to school staff and um, really work with parents and school teams to make sure we have a solid um, intervention plan for, for a child with autism. So they can attend IEP meetings, they can provide training, they can also provide education, um, both the family members and um, school staff, as well as um, uh, classmates uh, and to the students themselves with autism. So, so they, um, they can do a lot of things and they're typically not attached to, like I said, any one IEP team, but are called in as kind of like a special consultation kind of thing. And um, kids do not actually need a medical diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder in order to receive services from the autism resource team. Um, again, because we're non-categorical. So teams are gonna work with children that have a medical diagnosis as well as kids who have autism-like characteristics. Okay, and um, like I said, they're all called a little bit differently. Sometimes they're paired with other specialty teams, like maybe uh, behavior specialists. There's a few school districts out there that have um, their own autism specialists. Um, they're kind of far and few between, but um, few and far between, but uh, there are a few out there. And I just wanted to mention that these resource teams aren't typically involved with the diagnostic process for, for autism. So just like a screenshot here of like Central Rivers right their autism information here and they call their team the AEA well-being teams so there's an example where it's um those are the folks you would call in for your autism uh consultation if needed each AEA also has what's called a family and educator partnership and basically this is a program where they have um some folks who serve as liaisons between families and um the AEA and school districts um, to make sure we're getting everyone understanding each other and on the same page. Again, this is a screenshot this time from Grant Wood, AEA, um, but every AEA has one of these. And um, they can be a really nice resource for preparing for IEP meetings, um, if you're not understanding something to get clarification um, and understanding like these processes that I've um, kind of zip through today. Um, they can they can talk with you at much more length about them. Another great resource here in Iowa is a nonprofit called Ask Resource, which is out of Des Moines area, but they serve statewide. Um, and they really do a lot of training um, with families about um, educational services and rights, as well as kind of outside of the education domain as well. Um, and if you um, reach out to them, if you contact them, they can help you um, track down information about um, uh, what the law says, or if you have questions about what your IEP team, the rest of your IEP team is saying, they can help you sort through those kinds of things and advocate for your child. Here are the websites I would take a look at if you're not in Iowa, if you have to join us from somewhere else today and uh, want to start uh, thinking about educational programming in your area. So the first one is uh, the federal um, Department of Education. They have the con contacts uh, for every state listed here on this index. Autism Society, which is called Autism Society of America is another great place to get started for looking at those state affiliates, family voices, Again, they have affiliates and the I uh, and the Health and Human Services federal website as well has um, a very nice index of um, resources by state. Okay, with that, I am through this through this material and uh, looks like we have plenty of time for questions today. And feel free to type your questions in the question box and we'll give everyone a few minutes for that to come through. Um, we just had one comment. It said much better way of making decisions than the way it was done for school kids back in the 50s. Yes, we've come a long way. For sure.
Um, can you tell me the name of the two books you mentioned last week about helping kids eat? Um, I only remember one that I, I, I may put two on there, but I only remember the one was um, Broccoli Boot Camp. And it's um, written by the folks who have done, I think the most research of any of the research labs on behavioral approaches to, um, to treating eating challenges. And, um, but it's a book written for parents and families. So it's, I think a very readable version of um, the kind of things they do in clinic. And the next one is, sorry if someone has already asked, will we be able to have a link to the resources from the webinar series? And I can answer that. I will go through and put all those together in a handout and get those sent out to everybody, hopefully by the end of the week. So give me a few days to get that pulled, pulled together and send it out to you. Um, what type of education is needed to become a parent liaison at an AEA? Like the, um, yeah, the parent educator, the, the, Yes, the FEP person. Right. You no, know, I actually do not know the answer to that. Um, Erica, by chance, do you know the answer to that? No, I am. I am not sure. Um, I will look that up and um, and get the answer to Erica, and maybe she can send that out when she sends out the links and things. Sure, we can do that. Because now I'm curious, so I'll I'll find out for us. Well, it looks like that was the end of our questions for today. So thank you everyone for joining the series. I will send out a link to all the recordings. So in case you missed one along the way, um, you'll have those. If you do need a certificate of attendance after watching a recording, please be sure to email me and let me know which session you watched and that you need a, a certificate and we will make sure to get those out to you. Okay, there's a few more questions coming in as I was talking about that. Um, it says, well done, we enjoyed the series. Are there services that help children five year at home with autism? At home? Yes. Um, so, um, Typically, um, if a child, I'll just answer that there, there is on um, kind of rare occasion where a child has a, um, an IEP as a uh, preschool student, um, so in that early childhood special education years, that is called a um, speech-only IEP. Um, where they determine, um, yes, this child needs um, some assistance with their um, communication delay, but that's the only kind of goal area that we have. And so on occasion, then those children just um, are transported by like their, their family up to like a, a local school uh, building to meet with the speech pathologist or on very rare occasion, the speech pathologist might come to their, their home or daycare, although that's pretty rare. Um, but the idea is they're not gonna have preschool programming as part of their IEP. So, so that, does, that does occur um, again on, on rare occasion. Um, and then, you know, outside of school programming, of course, there's lots of interventions that people um, can, can seek out privately. Um, and I didn't cover as part of this uh, presentation, you know, and options in terms of um, online schooling or private school, uh, private school education or any of that. Um, so this was really focused on public school education and traditional public school education, I should add. Okay, thank you. The psychologist who evaluated my child suggested that a specialist from AEA come in and observe my child in the classroom. However, when I mentioned this to my child's counselor, she was not receptive. Can I contact the AEA myself to arrange this? Um, so you, on many of the AEA websites, um, you can find the names and perhaps contact information for the AEA autism consultants. 
Um, so I think if it's out there publicly, I mean, it's fine for you to reach out to them. They may tell you that they need a referral from um, your IEP team or you know someone at the at the level of the school anyway. Um, so I I would encourage you you know if you want to reach out directly I, I I think that's okay especially if their information is publicly available. Um, uh, but you may need to backtrack and, and meet with the IEP team. Um, not maybe not even like a full IEP meeting or anything, but just enough to say like, hey, can we pull this person as a consultant? And that would generally be a meeting with someone beyond just the school counselor. Okay. One more question. Is are autistic the numbers of autistic children on the rise? And if so, why do you think that is? Well, let's see. So I think in the four weeks that we've been giving this presentation, um, the new numbers came out. So, you know, I started uh, four weeks ago saying, I think that uh, it's 144 kids uh, based on CDC data. And then the new CDC report came out and, uh, and had it at one in 36. Um, and, you know, prior to one in 44, it was like one in 54. So yes, things are on the rise. There are many, um, there's lots of thought about why that is in terms of the widening of the diagnostic criteria. Um, and also um, thinking about, you know, maybe causes of autism and also uh, what they call diagnostic switching where um, some kids who are primarily diagnosed with autism now may have been categorized um, as primarily ADHD or learning disorder or something else um, 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pelzel, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.